Jack it! Mega Man! Execute! Oh, John, why would you even bother to make a video review for this game? It came out days ago. You had to play the game after launch because you're too much of a nobody to get an advanced review copy. It's actually quite simple. If I didn't, everyone would ask me what I thought of the collection for the rest of my life. So let's nip that little annoyance in the bud and get this obligatory nonsense out of the way. Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. My eternal patience has finally paid off. I started my Battle Network review series almost three years ago in preparation for this moment. The moment when the Battle Network Legacy Collection would finally release. And then it got delayed two years by the pandemic and I looked like an idiot, but it's here now and that's what matters. If you're new here, let me say immediately that this video is my initial impressions of the collection as a whole, not reviews for each individual game. If you're looking for that, you can check the playlist in the description where I have spent far too many hours of my life over the past few years looking at these damn games. Heads up, the first few videos are old and bad and I'm, no, I'm not proud of them, I don't like them, but the later videos are good. Now onto the collection itself. The Battle Network Legacy Collection opens on a charming 3D model of Mega Man.exe greeting you. Is it evening already? Time to kick back and relax then. Let's hang out for a bit. Watchers of the NT Warrior anime will recognize this wonderful surfer dude voice as Andrew Francis, the same guy who voiced Mega Man in the anime's English dub well over a decade ago. He has a variety of lines and quips he'll spew out depending on different circumstances or even the time of day. After saying hello to the blue boy, you're given the option to pick any of the games in the collection. Volume 1 contains Battle Networks 1 and 2, alongside both versions of Battle Network 3, White and Blue, while Volume 2 features Battle Network 4, Red Sun and Blue Moon, Battle Network 5, Team Proto Man and Team Colonel, topping off with Battle Network 6, Cybeast Gregar, and Cybeast Falzar. The collection also features the Japanese versions of each game that you can toggle between, but any differences aside from titles and text have been basically eliminated in this collection. If you've managed your way here but are unfamiliar with the Mega Man Battle Network series and are just curious what these games are even about or if you should buy this collection, I'll give you the quick rundown. In the year 2000, <laughs> in an alternate universe from the Mega Man you are likely familiar with, the world has come to heavily revolve around the internet. I know it's hard to believe. With most aspects of life reliant on and being controlled by the fascinating but completely nonsensical and confusing cyber world. To better navigate these netscapes, most people have their own personal terminal, or PET, which houses an artificial intelligence-based assistant called a Net Navigator, or Navi for short. The Battle Network series follows an excitable, but not all that bright young boy named Lan Hikari, alongside his best friend and Net Navi, Mega Man.exe. Together with their ever-expanding colorful group of friends and allies, Lan and Mega Man use their net battling skills to protect cyber society from all manner of evil goings-on. Gameplay primarily takes place in two forms. Overworld exploration, where you walk around the world and talk to people, buy new equipment, solve puzzles, and the like. This can be done as Lan or Mega Man, and there will be times where Lan can't progress or Mega Man can't progress, and they'll require some sort of help from their partner in the opposite world. For example, if Lan finds a door with a lock connected to a security system that he can't open, you need to find an area connected to the net where he can jack in with his PET and send Mega Man into the cyber world to find a solution. When playing as Mega Man, though, you're almost guaranteed to trigger at least a few random encounters in the cyber world, and that's where the second primary form of gameplay comes in, net battling. The net is filled with monsters of various shapes and forms known as viruses, as well as other hostile net navvies that try and stop Mega Man from saving the day. But our pair of heroes are more than capable in a fight, far more capable than they logically probably should be. When a battle begins, Lan is given a selection of battle chips that he can send in for Mega Man to use in combat. Each battle chip has a code below it. If the codes match together, or you use chips with the same name but different codes, you can send multiple chips at one time. Once Lan sends the battle chip data, the action phase starts and you're given control of Mega Man on the battle grid. You can use Mega Man's arm cannon, the Mega Buster, to deal damage, but it's very weak unless properly upgraded, so most of your power is going to come from the battle chips. There are hundreds of them, and each one has a unique property, whether that's dealing damage, healing, causing debuffs, granting support effects, and so on. That's where the deck building aspect of the game comes in. Setting up Lan's battle chip folder with the techniques you find most useful and codes that 
that you can combo together. You get 30 slots to fill up that will be randomly pulled from as the battle goes on. Each time this meter fills up, you can press L or R to pull up the chip screen again, and the process repeats until the virus is busted. There are tons of extra layers added to this combat system as the series goes on. Styles, soul unisons, counters, dark chips, beast out, a bunch of stuff, but this isn't the place to be getting into all those. Right off the bat, please realize that these are ports, not remasters. As such, the games retain their GBA sprite-based glory, as well as all of the original music and sounds. There's a smoothing filter that is definitely an emulator smoothing filter, and some screen size and border options, but for the most part, the games look and sound just as they did 20 years ago, give or take a very small audio timing change here or there. Not a bad thing at all, there's some very good sprite work on display here, and the soundtrack is nothing short of iconic, even with the GBA's terrible sound processing. The game is virtually, if not completely, input lag free, at least on the PC version I played on my Steam Deck. I can't speak for every other version, obviously. I didn't realize until now just how bad the old ass version of VBA I used for my reviews was. Things I had major issues with in my retrospectives, like dodging certain enemies or rapid fire attacks like the Guts machine gun, are now no problem whatsoever. I was unaware how hard I was gimping myself this entire time on accident. The collection is far more responsive and snappy. The only major presentation change is the text font, and it's easily the most controversial change to this collection, which I'd argue is a good thing if the font is the biggest red flag. I'll just say it, it looks... Uh, in the first three games anyway. Battle Networks 1, 2, and 3 have a slightly more realistic color palette and art style that does not fit these smooth, almost bubbly letters. It fits much better in the back half when the art direction shifted over to more simplified, colorful visuals. Is it a deal breaker? Is it a serious detriment to the game? N no, of course not. And to be real with you, after about five minutes, I didn't even notice it anymore. But people would be mad if I didn't address it. So here's the big stuff you've been waiting for. What does this collection bring to the table that gives it an advantage over just sailing the high seas, or what have you? A surprising amount, actually. A lot of extra care went into this collection compared to the previous Mega Man collections, and those games are still pretty damn good. For starters, since these are, I believe, ports, or at the very least, weird ROMs with some kind of layer being run over them, a handful of small annoyances have been fixed throughout the six titles. Things like some broken chip combination glitches that could ruin PvP, restoring content that was originally missing in the Western releases like the Box High crossovers, or stopping the endlessly looping panic music at the end of Battle Network 6, have been remedied. These sorts of things, like restoring content, will make post-game playthroughs much simpler and require much less hacking and patching on the player's part. Contrary to a lot of early reports that I guess were just lying, the English localizations have not been changed outside of a small number of names or words. This means the original translations, which were made on a very tight schedule and featured a buttload of mistakes, weird phrasings, and hilarious misspellings, are still present. I would have liked to seen these addressed, but legs go will always make me laugh, so I'm going to look past this. Your expected galleries and jukebox features are here as well, allowing you to look at and listen to tons of art and songs from the Battle Network franchise. Even a handful of really early concept art sketches that are cool to see are here. There's also a Buster Max mode that cranks the Mega Buster up to 100 and lets you tear through the games with the strength of God himself. Perfect for grinding for PvP, or completing post-game chip libraries, an infamously arduous and time-consuming task, as well as getting through super easy early parts of the game on repeat playthroughs. Trophies and Chivos are unaffected by this cheat, so feel free to use it when the random encounter spam gets on your nerves. But all of that doesn't touch the absolute coolest addition to the collection in my opinion. The ability to freely acquire all of the special live event Japan exclusive battleships in each game, and on that same note, the addition of all 499 Japanese exclusive e-reader cards. For the youngums out there, the e-reader was a card scanning peripheral for the Game Boy Advance, which could play simple games or add content to existing games that for a variety of reasons never really caught on in the West, so tons of games had special e-reader cards that were just never translated or brought over. Battle Network was especially bad about this, with hundreds of extra power-ups and items and features locked behind these mod cards that no one outside of Japan could reliably get their hands on, until now that is. With all of the cards now available to 
activate from a separate menu in the Legacy Collection. Extra items, special power-ups, changing your charge shot into other things, changing Mega Man's color, menu colors, and yes, even the elusive base cross form. Alright, this is the big one for a lot of people. This feature is presumably why the collection was delayed for so long, if I had to guess, online multiplayer. Despite many people assuming the collection would omit its connection features entirely for obvious reasons, the crazy lads and lasses over at Capcom not only kept but expanded on Battle Network's link cable activities. You can trade battle chips with other players in all games, and some games even let you trade styles or upgrade programs as well. You can match chip libraries with someone else to fill in your blank spots and see what you may be missing. In Battle Network 4 specifically, you can send boss navvies from one game to another and create your own own tournament brackets to challenge, and most importantly of all, you can net battle against other people all over the world with online PvP. A feature that so few were able to partake in, including myself, is now easily accessible to everyone. There are a handful of additional rules you can toggle on or off, as well as a new ranked mode where you can climb to higher letter grades the more you win, just like any other modern multiplayer game. With no crossplay, I'm sorry to report. Unfortunately, I've never touched a single one of these features until this collection, so I can't tell you, oh, this thing is different, or this PvP thing was changed, because I quite simply do not know. There are more PvP-oriented people on YouTube who I'm sure will be making videos going over that stuff. What I can tell you is that the PvP and trading features work, and I'm bad at it. Um, <laughs> what more do you need to know? Just like a regular fighting game, the amount of input lag you experience is very much dependent on your and your opponent's connection. I've had matches that have near a full second of input lag, and matches with absolutely zero input lag whatsoever. So it seems to be more of a people's internet thing than a thing with the game. But regardless, this feature will be great for the community and the game's longevity, so even if it doesn't interest me that much, I can see how important it is to others. So, when viewed as a whole, is the Battle Network Legacy Collection with all of its addition and changes the best way to play this series of action RPG classics? Yes. Uh, 90% yes. <laughs> for a casual player or someone who played the game years ago and is just looking for that fix, absolutely. It's a no-brainer, you should buy this collection now. You're looking at $10 a piece for six 20 hour plus games, some of which have two versions, and all of which have online functionality and bonus features. But for hardcore Battle Network fans who are deeply entrenched in the series and have played the games multiple times, while the collection is still great and pretty much the best way to replay these games as they are, I have to be honest here, there is a decent handful of quality of life changes that I wish would have been made. There's a couple really infamous issues with the games that in a perfect world they would have gone the extra mile to fix. Uh, English battle chips and their descriptions are still heavily and sometimes hilariously compressed to fit GBA text size restrictions, to the point where some of the text is worthless in determining how a chip actually functions. Battle Network 4, with its random scenarios and tedious repeat playthroughs, could have greatly benefited from some sort of cheat or tournament seed generator or something to help cut down the RNG forcing you to play the same parts of the game over and over. Then there's Operate Shooting Star and Double Team DS. Without digging into everything, as I have either already or will cover these games individually, these are upgraded DS ports of Battle Network 1 and 5 with a lot of extra features, balance changes, and quality of life improvements, making them the definitive version of those titles. Unfortunately, none of those additions to those games made it in. These are the Game Boy Advance games through and through. So the fixed elect dungeon, Star Force Mega Man, Soul Cross, and the team up mechanics, among other small touches, are absent from the Legacy Collection. Even then, Battle Network 5's easy access to online and the mod cards can be seen as a worthy trade-off. And if you play on PC, it's likely someone will mod those other features in eventually. Modders have already discovered how to access the game's sprites and sounds, so it's only a matter of time, I'm sure. That little wish list aside, I would still very much recommend buying the Legacy Collection, as the rest of the package is still absolutely worth it in its current state. It is the best way to play these GBA games as they currently exist, absolutely. Me wishing for a few extra tweaks here and there doesn't change that, and I can't hold it against a port collection for not completely overhauling some stuff that there was no indication would be overhauled. There's still over a hundred hours of dystopian internet fun to be had here with brainlit Hikari and the little blue cell phone that could.
And not to sound like a shill, but Capcom only listens to sales and uses these re-release collections to gauge interest in their properties, so if you want new Mega Man stuff, it's probably a good idea to buy this thing to send the right message. You don't want to end up like Darkstalkers, do you?